I'm Eddie Hyatt. This is Revive America. So glad you've joined me today. In just a few minutes, I'm going to be taking you into a recent Revive America event where I was speaking and where I was demonstrating and showing how our nation, how America was birthed out of a great spiritual awakening. So don't go anywhere. I'm going to take you there just in a few minutes. But first of all, I want to invite you to connect with me Connect with me in different ways. Uh, you can go to my website, eddiehyatt.com. And uh, there on my website, there are you, you'll see my vision for Revive America. You'll also find articles. You will also find videos. You will find uh, past broadcasts. You'll see a YouTube a link there that you can go and you can listen to all of the previous broadcasts. There's even a place there where you can make a donation to help out with the cost of Revive America. So check out my website, eddiehyatt.com. Hey, connect with me on Facebook, Eddie L. Hyatt. There is also a Revive America page and I would like to invite you to go there and like that page, uh, post a comment, um, uh, whatever you would like to say about it. And then, of course, you can connect with me uh, by writing to me. Our address uh, is P.O. Box 3877, Grapevine, Texas, 76099. And, of course, I have an email, Hyatt at gmail.com. And also, you can follow me on Twitter. If you have a Twitter account, please follow me on Twitter, and you will receive some updates of articles and things that are happening uh, by that means. Yes, my friends, what we are doing, what we are saying here is very vital for America and for America's future because the future of America does not reside in Washington, D.C. The future of America is not in the hands of a politician in Washington or any place else. It's not residing on the next election the future of America is in the hands of the people of God, those who are called by His name. Because God said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people who are called by my name, if, this is a conditional promise, it will happen if we do certain things. And I believe He mentioned four things. If we will if we will pray, first of all, humble ourselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, God promises then, not before, but then will I hear from heaven. In other words, there will be a breaking in from heaven into our midst. Almighty God, our creator, will come down and he said he would heal our land. Folks, that is what will save America. It's what will save England, Ireland, Canada, whoever is watching in any nation, whoever we are, this is what we must have is a divine invasion from heaven, God's culture of heaven, God's kingdom coming down into our midst. And that is why I'm inviting you to pray with me and believe God with me for another great spiritual awakening in this land. If you are a pastor or a Christian leader and uh, you would like to invite me to your city, I have a PowerPoint presentation that I present documenting how this nation was birthed out of a great spiritual awakening, documenting the very Christian vision of those first immigrants to America and what a powerful impact it has on audiences because all of a sudden we see the truth of how America was born. And all oh, that is so important at this time in our history. So I trust that you will continue to pray and support this ministry. And I am going to take you now into a Revive America event in Picayune, For he Mississippi. Will, I am certain, assist me once more to speak in his name. Yeah. And according to those 
there that day, they said it seemed like a supernatural force and power came upon him. And all of a sudden, his voice was vivid and alive. And he began to preach. And he preached on and on for an hour. And then he cried out. He shouted, I go. I go to rest prepared. My body fails. My spirit expands. How willingly I would ever live to preach Christ. How willingly I would ever live to preach Christ. But I die. To be with him. After the meeting, people, the thousands there, they were so moved and people were weeping and crying out to God. And he went home with the pastor in the area, Jonathan Parsons, who pastored the the Old South Presbyterian Church and he stayed in the parsonage. But hundreds of people were so moved that they followed them to the parsonage. They didn't want to leave. And so Whitfield saw the crowds gathered around outside the parsonage and he came out, it's dark, it's night now, he came out with a candle. And he said, I'll preach till the candle goes out. So he held the candle and he continued to preach until the candle burned down and the flame went out and he went in and retired to the bed and it was sort of almost an outward thing of what was happening in his spirit. Because sometime during the night, George Whitfield's spirit left his body, went home to be with Jesus, and he was buried there under the pulpit (laughs) of the church there next door. And Sue and I stopped there this past summer. And I just talked a little bit about George Whitfield and his impact on America because George Whitfield became the most recognized figure in colonial America. Say that again. He became the most recognized figure because of his travels in colonial America. And because of his preaching, because he was so... There wasn't a denominational bone in his body. Even though he was ordained with the Anglican church and a part of the Methodist revival, he reached out to all peoples, everybody. There was one sermon. uh, Benjamin Franklin said, the people of all sects and denominations that attended his sermons, he said, were enormous. And in one message... Whitfield mimicked a conversation with Father Abraham who was looking down over the balconies of heaven. And he cried out, Father Abraham, are there any Anglicans in heaven? And the, the, the voice came back, Father Abraham called back, no, there are no Anglicans here in heaven. Father Abraham, are there any Baptists in heaven? No, there are no Baptists here either. Father Abraham, were there any Methodists in heaven? No, there are not none of those either. If he was preaching today, he'd use some of our, our, our modern denominations, Assemblies of God, Church of God, and, and, you know, the conversation back and forth. No, there are none of those either. And, and, of course, he's preaching to a crowd of all different people of different theological persuasions and denominations. And he cries out, well, Father Abraham, what kind of people are in heaven? And Father Abraham calls back, there are only Christians in heaven, only those who have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so Whitfield cries out to the, uh, to the crowd and to Father Abraham. He says, oh, is that the case? Then God help me and God help us all to stop living by labels and be Christians in deed and in truth. Yeah. Hallelujah. Whitfield's meetings were interracial. In fact, he talks about how he felt his heart drawn out to those of African descent in America. And he would speak directly to them when they were in his congregations or in the midst and in the crowds. And he tells about in one situation uh, when he preached in Philadelphia... And in his sermon, he saw that there were quite a number of black people there and he preached directly to them. And one black woman later said he must have been in a trance for him to say that he thinks that he did. 
She was so overwhelmed and her heart so melted by his words. And he said in his farewell sermon at Philadelphia, I want to actually to read to you what he said about that. He said that after he retired to his lodging, this is in his journal, he said, Near 50 Negroes came to give me thanks for what God had done for their souls. And he considered this an answer to prayer, saying, I have been much drawn in prayer for them and have seen them wrought upon by the word preached. A young 17-year-old Phyllis Wheatley a young black woman who was in his meetings, testified to the impact of the awakening on African Americans in a tribute she wrote in honor of Whitfield at the time of his death. She was actually America's first published black poet. And at Whitfield's death, she wrote a a long eulogy, a poem about him. And this is just one verse. She said, Thou didst in strains of eloquence refined inflame the heart and captivate the mind. The greatest gift that even God can give, he freely offered to the numerous throng. Take him, you Africans, he longs for you. Impartial Savior is his title view. And so what was happening in the Great Awakening? Denominational barriers were being broken down. Racial barriers were being broken down by the preaching of the gospel. God was preparing colonial America for something new and something powerful. Further north in New England, the Great Awakening, Jonathan Edwards and his wife Sarah Pierpoint, Sarah Pierpoint's grandfather, some of you here this morning, Thomas Hooker was the founder of Connecticut. So she was from a long line of Puritan preachers. Their Their romance and marriage is very, very interesting. I I have some things about that in the book and and, and on my website and blog. But they became very concerned about what they call the spiritual deadness throughout the land and set themselves to pray for what they called a revival of religion. And God answered their prayers. That's a a sermon that he became famous for, Jonathan Edwards, called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. You won't find too many sermons like that today. (laughs) But I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a little bit. But when this revival came, when the awakening came to New England, Jonathan Edwards said the town, not the church, he said the town seemed to be full of the presence of God. Everywhere you went, there was this strange sense of God's presence everywhere you went. And everywhere you went in people's homes, places of business, people's minds were consumed with God and they wanted to talk about God. They wanted to talk about salvation and Jesus and eternity. He said the tavern was soon left empty. A loose, careless person could scarcely be found. And if there was anyone that seemed to remain senseless or unconcerned, it would be spoken of as a strange thing that would be like when such a great awakening is occurring here in Picayune. And you're talking to a friend and you say, you know, I had the strangest experience today. Well, what was that? You know, I went into Walmart to pick up some things and I came across a person. They just seemed so spiritually indifferent and unconcerned. Isn't that strange that somebody at this time would be unconcerned about their soul and the things of God? What was the message of the Great Awakening? Let me just read. Before I go through this, I want to read a quote from Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards said, Our public assemblies were then beautiful. 
What did he mean beautiful? He meant because of the presence of God, there was the beauty of God. He says they were beautiful. The congregation was alive in God's service. Everyone intent on the public worship. Every here eager to drink in the words of the minister. The assembly were in general from time to time in tears while the word was preached, while he's up there reading his sermon in a monotone voice. People are are weeping. (laughs) Jonathan Edwards did not preach very much on hell, but he went to a neighboring city, Enfield, Connecticut, And he had put together a message called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God to highlight the dangers of people who are outside of Christ. And so as he was reading his message about the peerless condition of those outside of Christ and how they are hanging in the balance and on the edge of eternity without God, the Spirit of God made hell so real to people that many begin to grip the back of their benches because they felt like the, the earth may open, they'd slip into hell. They begin to cry out to God for mercy. That old church building, it had pillars in it, and some people leaped from their seats and they ran and wrapped their arms around the pillars and were crying out to God for mercy. And Jonathan Edwards is up there reading his sermon. <laughs> oh, Hallelujah. But you know the key I read somewhere that Jonathan Edwards, his heart was so hungry for God and to see New England awakened that before he went to the pulpit and read this sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, that he had spent 18 hours in prayer and his heart was so consumed with a desire to see God work, that his prayer was, God, give me New England or let me die. God, if you are not going to awaken this New England people, I don't want to live anymore. That's what you call a fervent prayer. (laughs) And he went from there and read his sermon, and the power of God fell. And the great awakening began to erupt throughout New England. And city, village, town after town was seized by the presence of God and entire towns turning to God, repenting and turning to God. What was the message? What did they preach? They had a similar message. By the way, I have a quote. It comes later, but I'll go ahead and quote it because I know what he said. Perry Miller, the Harvard professor that I have quoted who was an expert in early American history, said this. He said, the Declaration of Independence of 1776 was a direct result of the preaching of the evangelist of the Great Awakening. Let me say that again. A Harvard professor of history said the Declaration of Independence of 1776 was a direct result of the preaching of the evangelist of the Great Awakening. And it wasn't their style of preaching because they didn't have the same style. It was the content of the message. What was the content of their message? Well, you know, in studying this, I decided I've delineated seven points that I think were, would express the content of their messages. They preach that God is a great, majestic, and holy being who created all things and to whom all creatures owe their love, honor, and respect. Secondly, they preached about the fall and that we are a fallen race. That Adam and Eve, our first parents, rebelled against their their creator dragging their posterity down with them into the abyss of sin and judgment, which theologically is known as the fall. And we have all been affected by that. We have all sinned and fallen short 
of the glory of God. They preach that in our natural state we are part of a fallen race and we stand guilty and condemned before an infinitely holy and righteous and just God. They preached that God would have been just to send the whole human race to hell. God would have been righteous to send us to hell because we had offended his holiness. We had sinned against him. We all have sinned and fallen short. And that not a single angel in heaven would have protested if God had sent the human race to hell because they would have seen that he would have been righteous and just in doing so. Oh, but they also preach that God in his sovereign grace and mercy chose to save fallen and sinful humanity and that he now offers full pardon and forgiveness of sin to all who will put their faith in Jesus Christ. Talking about the message of the great awakening. They also emphasize that the people were to get rid of faulty foundations on which they had built their faith. What were the faulty foundations? Church membership was a faulty foundation. Well, I belong to the first church so-and-so. They said, that's a faulty foundation. That won't get you to heaven. Well, I come from a really good family. You know, my father was a deacon in this church and, and his father was a deacon and I'm now a member of that church. I come from this really good family. They said, that's a faulty foundation. It's not adequate. Well, I'm a, I'm a good person. You know, I belong to this lodge. I belong to this association and we do all these charitable events and we help people out. You know, and I've never done really anything bad. They said, that's a faulty foundation you're building on. And they pointed out all the faulty foundations upon which people had put their faith that God had accepted them. And in their words, they, they sought to overturn all of the faulty foundations on which people had built their faith. Number six, they preached... It's not any of those things. It's a new birth in Jesus Christ. It's a regeneration, giving yourself to God and allowing God to come in and in His life and His spirit and bring about a new birth that brings about a new tenor, brings about new desires. Not that you're perfect, but they believe that there was, would be a fruit of righteousness not that people would be perfect, but their lives would be different because of this new birth and the life of God coming into them. And so they preach very strongly, you must be born again. Amen. They also preached in a heaven and a hell that there is eternal bliss in heaven for all who trust in Christ and eternal suffering and damnation for all who refuse God's gracious gift of salvation in Christ. Very interesting story comes from Jonathan Edwards. He tells about that during the awakening, there was a man in the community who was known as a very wicked, ungodly man who was also a drunkard. He said he came to him one day in a very sober frame of mind and told him about a dream he had had the previous night. That he had died and he had gone to hell. And he said in hell he was told that he was going to be given a one-year probation and being sent back to earth on a one-year probation to get his life straightened out. And he told this to Jonathan Edwards, and Jonathan Edwards assured him that God was trying to get his attention. And Jonathan Edwards wrote down the date of he'd had this talk with this man. And he said the man seemed to outwardly to, to, to make a change and a turn. He started attending church. He left off the bottle and seemed to be doing well, he said, but about six months later, he returned to his old ways. And he said, one day, somebody came, came rushed uh, to his office, and to the church, and said, so-and-so just, has just died. 
he was in a drunken state and he started to go down some stairs and he failed and tumbled down and he broke his neck. And, and Jonathan Edwards, he got this message. He said he turned over to when he had written down when this man had come to him and said he had had this very sobering dream that, it, that he had gone to hell, but they, in hell he was told that he was being given a one-year probation. And Jonathan Edwards said, when I read the date, I felt very somber and sober. He said, for it was one year exactly from the date he had had the dream of being given a one-year probation from hell. Oh, I know that you were blessed and your heart stirred and lifted by that message about how God brought forth this nation out of a great spiritual awakening. And our God has never changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what he's done in the past, he will do it again. I hope that you will connect with me. I want to hear from you. You can connect with me in different ways. Well, you can go to my website, eddiehyatt.com, and uh, there you can read about our vision that God has dropped in our hearts. And there are articles, there are videos, uh, just all sorts of things there on my website that is there to be a blessing to you. Our bookstore is there. You can order books. So many things to bless you there at uh, eddiehyatt.com. Also, I invite you to connect with me on Facebook, Eddie L. Hyatt. And there's more than one Eddie Hyatt on, on uh, Facebook. Just make sure it's the one in Grapevine, Texas. Eddie L. Hyatt in Grapevine, Texas. And I would love for you to friend me on Facebook. Also, Revive America has a Facebook page called the Revive America Project. Please go there and like it. Also, post a comment. Let us know if this program is being a blessing to you. And then you can email me, Dr. Eddie Hyatt at gmail.com. Connect with me by email if you would like. And then there is our mailing address, Eddie and Sue Hyatt, P.O. Box 3877, Grapevine, Texas. 76099. You know, and we've been talking about revival and what does, you know, and many ask, well, what, what is revival? What does revival look like? It is not something that is humanly planned and orchestrated. True revival cannot be planned and strategized and orchestrated by human ingenuity. True revival comes down from God out of heaven. Like it says on the day of Pentecost, it says that they were all together in one place. It says, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven. And as I've said in the past, this was not their audio visual department creating some sounds. You know, we in the modern church in America, we've become very adept and skilled at producing our own earthly sounds. But oh, when God comes down out of heaven, when God's people pray, there is something from another world, something outside of ourselves. There is a sound from heaven that comes down into our midst. Something that cannot be humanly, humanly defined or put in a box. But you know when it's there, it's God's life. And, and our, our hearts are renewed. Our passion for Jesus and our concern for souls and love for one another are renewed there in the presence of God and of His Holy Spirit. Pray with me for another revival, a great awakening in our land. Until I see you next time on Revive America, I'm Eddie Hyatt. God bless you. See you next time.